morning and welcome to worship with us here at Faith Lutheran Church in Ronan, Montana for Sunday, October 25th. We're very glad that you've decided to join us. As you can see, I've uh, changed my stole colors and the colors of our vestments. Uh, it is red for this week because today is Reformation Sunday. Uh, we are celebrating the Protestant Reformation that kicked off 503 years ago when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg. This was an important moment for the world uh, and especially for the church. And we bear his name still today as Lutherans as we identify as a Lutheran congregation and follow his teachings and theology as well as the Lutheran confessions. Uh, what you may not know is that 500 years ago this year, in 1520, Martin Luther received, was actually excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church and received his papal bull of excommunication. Essentially, the church kicked him out, and in so doing, uh, kicked the rest of us out with them, uh, who agreed with, uh, agreed with the true teachings of the gospel. And uh, so 500 years ago this year is really when the Lutheran Church started. And we give thanks to God for all the powerful work that has gone on uh, since then and since in the you know, five centuries in between. This year has uh, definitely seen a lot of other Reformation moments, if you will. A lot of adapting, a lot of changing, a lot of disruption to how we do things. We continue to remain diligent. Uh, for those who feel comfortable with the risk, we are still having in-person worship service here at Faith Lutheran, but encourage people to worship from home if uh, you're worried about getting the virus. The safest way to worship still is to worship remotely. And so we encourage both online worship and in-person. Uh, hospitals are uh, kind of in a scary moment across western Montana here from Missoula to Kalispell and even here in Ronan people are being hospitalized and some are having to be put on ventilators so we, we pray for all those who are uh, falling ill uh, we continue to pray for all those who are falling ill with COVID-19 as well as give thanks to God for all those who have recovered there will be an end to this pandemic one day and we look forward to that day with all that being said, we, can, we begin our Reformation worship service uh, <clears throat> and as we take a moment and prepare our hearts for worship. We begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have, have not, not loved you with our whole heart. heart. We, we have, have not loved, loved our neighbors, neighbors as ourselves. ourselves. For, For the, the sake, sake of your Son, Son Jesus Christ, Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we, we may delight in your will, will and, and walk in your ways. ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Salvation. 
Let us pray together our prayer of the day. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our gospel lesson for this week is John chapter 8, verses 31 to 36. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? 
Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Here ends our gospel lesson. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 500 years ago this year, in 1520, Martin Luther was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church for preaching the gospel. While there is a lot more details to the story, the history pretty much just boils down to the fact that the Western Christian Church with the Pope at its head had drifted so far from the teaching, preaching, and living according to scripture that Martin Luther sounded like a heretic, heretic to the powers that be when he proclaimed that the church should be recentered on our sacred texts. The church authorities all the way up to the Pope cared more about their positions and their profits it was actually a big business to be a bishop or a pope back in those days. They cared so much about their positions and their profits that they could not abide the truth. So they tried to sideline the one preaching truth rather than let the truth set them free. How did it come to that? How had the church that had risen from the tomb with Jesus Christ himself on that first Easter Sunday become so corrupted? How had the institution founded on belief in a loving God, good news for the poor, and redemption for the persecuted, how had that institution become itself become the persecutors, preaching judgment against the, against the poor by a vengeful God? How had the church the body of Christ in the world, designed to preach good news, become bad news for so many. The tides of history move slowly, powerfully, and widely. But firm distinctions can be drawn from time to time. That is to say, there are many things that went into necessitating Luther's call for reformation many of which are hard to pin down in one simple sermon. Yet one practice of the church that also started simply, as well as spiritually and faithfully, had become woefully corrupt by the time Luther was born. The practice of penance. Penance, the practice of doing acts of contrition after having sinned and confessed those sins to a priest was believed to be part of how one makes amends to God after having sinned. Originally, this was taught to be distinct from the practice of confession and forgiveness that we still practice here in our congregation weekly. They, the church at that time also taught that once we confess our sins to God, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins outright through no act required on our part. God is good and gracious, and they also believe that God forgives all who ask for forgiveness with no questions asked of them in return. Yet the church at that time went further and taught that God then expects acts of penance to be paid for the wrongdoing. Things like saying extra Hail Mary prayers, doing acts of service, praying the Lord's Prayer several times extra, donating money to the poor, or extra things along these lines. When practices of penance took a major turn in 1095 when Pope Urban II preached that Western European Christians were to take up the cross and fight to conquer the Holy Land and the Holy City of Jerusalem for Roman Catholics, taking control of it from Middle Eastern Muslims who then occupied the Holy City. Part of his appeal to knights and soldiers heading off into the unknown and likely death on the church's behalf 
was the issuance of the first plenary indulgence. Now, this was sort of a spiritual GI bill that freed the first crusaders from having to do any acts of penance, especially upon their deaths, if they died in service of the Pope's call to arms. Now, this was all well and good at the moment. As much as we can say anything about the crusades was all well and good. But this practice took a dark turn over time as priests, bishops, archbishops, and yes, even popes, began the business of selling these indulgences to everyday folks all the time. And this basically turned into massive and obvious spiritual extortion campaigns that got people believing that they had to pay for their spot in heaven. Perhaps good news for the rich, but devastating news for the poor. What's more, indulgences were issued much like modern day bonds are for municipal projects. If a city or town was building a cathedral or a new bishop had to buy his position, suddenly indulgence peddlers descended on that town or county to say that everyone needed to buy indulgences there in order to pay for their or their loved ones places in heaven. Just a few miles up the road, nobody was selling or buying these things at the same time. The grift was obvious, devastating, corrupt, abhorrent, and amounted to fraudulent financial and spiritual exploitation of the poor by the church. Centuries later, I am still ashamed to be the spiritual descendant of these guys. Coincidentally, many of the finest cathedrals throughout Western Europe were built during this time and were funded in no small part through these sinful indulgence programs. So, Luther called them on it and they kicked him out. They thought that they could silence the message. But they, underbest, they underestimated how fed up the people were with being taken advantage of by a church that cared more about its power than its people. For example, the messengers from the Vatican who were dispatched to actually deliver the papal bull of Luther's excommunication. That is, the Pope's order or decree that Luther be kicked out of the church. These guys who were the, the, taking this message up to northeastern Germany had a really hard time actually delivering it to Luther because they had to pass through so many areas full of people who were fed up with the church and were supporters of Luther for preaching the true gospel. Then, when they did actually give it to him, he was able to throw a big bash where he burned the letter publicly, basically saying that the Pope's orders meant nothing. And the people cheered. The people cheered in celebration. It was quite the disruptive time to be alive as the violent and bloody years to come would prove. Now, this is the origin story of the Protestant Reformation in general, and the Lutheran Church in particular. The Roman Catholic Church kicked us out for preaching the gospel and still have not found a way to repent of the institutional wrongdoing of the 15th and 16th centuries and welcome us back to this day. Fortunately, amazing and powerful work has been done to reconcile Roman Catholic teaching with what the Bible actually says over the centuries. And there have been powerful and joint statements of theological agreement between Lutherans and Catholics over the past few decades. Yet, sadly, the cat was kind of let out of the bag 500 years ago this year. And the Christian church has been marked by embarrassing division and schism ever since. Protestants have just kept fracturing and fracturing, starting new church after new church, 
without any real thought to unity. It all started because the Roman Catholic Church believed it more prudent to discard those preaching the truth than to repent and to let the truth set them free. So what does this mean for us today? This all happened long before we were born in distant lands, between governments and church systems that don't even exist anymore. Why should we care? Well, I would say that we, especially Americans, we should learn from the mistakes of the past. Or we are doomed to repeat them. Now, as much as ever, it is critical for us all to pay attention to where we have come from as a way of discerning the direction we should go next. Look, look to the past to find a way clear to the future. As church-going Christians, though, I think this Reformation Sunday, we should learn the lesson from 1520, that a church that refuses to repent and let the truth set it free. That church is bound for trouble. God does not expect us to be perfect, but God does expect us to be repentant. The church of the 16th century was so wrapped up in its own power and position at the head of European society that it could no longer hear God speaking through God's holy word. Popes pretended that their words were on par and actually higher than God's word. And when Luther called them out on it, they refused to listen. Cardinals, archbishops, kings, and other nobility, all of these rallied around their false prophets with their false interpretations. And the world only descended into chaos. They refused to listen to the truth, so the truth could not set them free. The good news for us is that we do hear the truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ, preached freely here every week. This is where we stand when we read the gospel, or this is why we stand when we read the gospel every Sunday. We don't do this because we like liturgical aerobics of standing up and sitting down when the pastor tells us to. Perhaps some of you think that. But no, we do this as an act of reverence. Reverence for the gospel words that liberate us from sin, death, and the devil. Our church prioritizes translation work from ancient Greek and Hebrew so that we can help all people to read the Bible for themselves in their own language. And in turn, to teach our children and their children what it all means so that they can know this freedom for themselves. Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, comes to set us free from all that would hold us down. And we are reassured of this truth weekly through the gospel passages we read, the sermons we hear, and the hymns we sing. The truth has come. And as we come to know the truth, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Word and our worship together as a repentant church. As we come to know the truth, the truth does indeed set us free. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. <laughs> Show each other sides of peace. <laughs> now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from your Son and bring to naught all he has done. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known. For you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your holy church that we may sing your praise eternally. O Comforter of Priceless Word, send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to life. We'll sing to your dawn the end.